All right, I'm going to be talking about, I think, a fairly important topic that a lot of organizations struggle uh, with is how do you improve the quality of the incoming code. Uh, we have all this knowledge about extreme programming for the last 15 years at least. Uh, but like Jess was pointing out in his keynote, not a lot has changed. I mean, we still see the same set of hands go up. And I was honestly to be, I was honestly surprised so many hands went up. My experience in the industry is like half of the people were lying. It, it is, it's far from that. Uh, and so this is based on a few, uh, you know, really popular startups that have been involved recently, at least in the last four, five years. And I, every startup you go and you look at the state of affairs there and you're like, you know, this is taking us 20 years back. Uh, but that's just the reality of how things are. So let me get this off. That's just the reality of how things are. And so what do we do with this reality? How do we make progress? Uh, and how do we get people to uh, look at some of the things that are important from a code quality point of view? And also time for us to introspect and see, are we getting too dogmatic as a community? that you know you should do this 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 maybe some of those things are not relevant anymore right and i'm going to talk about uh, you know, test driven development particularly uh, and and my experience of not having done test driven development for at least the last since 2013 so uh, it's it's been a while uh, and and some of the thought processes around why uh, why that uh, but more importantly right uh, why do we care about code quality? Coming back into the topic and just setting the context, right? Why do we care about uh, code quality? The reason I'm asking this question is when you go in and you see organizations which are very successful, uh, then you ask yourself, you know, is your understanding of code quality itself flawed? Or is there something going on here that you, you know, that, that is just very superficial and these guys are going to burn down and crash? Uh, so you kind of keep asking yourself these introspective questions. And so I ask myself, like, why do I care about code quality? I care about code quality because, you know, none of us want, uh, you know, expensive disasters to happen in your software. If, you're, uh, if your software is accepting payments, you don't want to be basically taking people's money and then losing that money, right? Uh, you don't want to have bad things happen to you. Uh, so this is one of the fears which basically drives people to, to kind of build high quality software. Uh, there are things around, you know, delays, delays because of, uh, you know, having issues in your software and not being able to put it out there on time and that causing people who are expecting certain things to be released not being available. Uh, stress and burnout is another issue because if you have lack of uh, quality, uh, then generally you see people are kind of always in this firefighting mode and trying to deal with issues all the time and you know nobody likes to be in that situation so you want to avoid some of these issues and it does cause a lot of frustration on the users if the software does not work the way they expect it to work right so you want to avoid some of this uh, and this leads to kind of erosion of trust in people uh, when when the software doesn't do what it's expected to do and you start losing your credibility as 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 someone building the software uh, so and there may be a lot more reasons, but generally these are kind of some of the important reasons why companies really care about quality of code. And uh, whenever you're in doubt, I would encourage you to go back to these first principles and say, okay, in this company, uh, you know, is any one of these issues that we are dealing with, right? We may see the code quality is really bad and it may not be up to the standards that we expect, but how is that actually visible? Is it one of these things that is actually coming out? Uh, you know, how is it visible? Uh, a lot of times, I'm sure you're familiar with these, uh, the, the ice cream cone problem, right? The ice cream cone testing problem. So this is basically if you map out, you know, the number of tests, uh, the percentage wise in, in, your, uh, in your product, uh, you know, a lot of times you find very little unit tests a whole bunch of integration tests and a very heavy focus on things like Selenium or Appium or one of these automation testing frameworks and then a whole bunch of manual checking on top of that, right? So this is, this is referred to as the ice cream cone problem. And I'll come, come to, you know, is this bad and how do we deal with this and things like that. Uh, but, you know, the, the problems that we often find 
uh, that I talked about leads to us having to typically approach these problems in certain ways. So I'm sure everyone has faced some of these problems that I talked earlier. Yes? Anyone who doesn't face these problems? Probably you should be speaking here, not me. Right, so what is the typical approach one would take when you see one of those problems, right? Delays, bugs, uh, you know, frustration, people being stressed out. What, what do you, how do you deal with those issues in your company? I want this to be interactive, so I know I'm not talking to walls. How do you deal with some of these issues? What are the typical approaches you've used? Yeah? So we introduce a lot more quality gates, a lot more checks, a lot more processes in place to basically make sure that bad things don't get out of control. All right, automation and quality gates. Okay, that's a good one. So you kind of share. Uh, actual uh, get get users to give your developers to see actual users pain and and experience that pain. Yes, get get to feel the customer experience. Sometimes dog fooding, right? People you know encourage dog fooding. Use your own products. If you can use it, other people can use it. Anything else? So trying to create a culture in the company where quality is emphasized and you know you you know it, it becomes kind of a key selling feature as you said. That's cool. Yeah. So you put a picture of your parents on your desk and then you ask developers that before you uh, say ready for tests, uh, you know, would you, would you show it to your mom? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, what I, I typically see is people do things like these, right? Send all your developers to a two-day uh, training on how to write better quality code. Yes? And what do you see after that? If, if, if at all there's a difference, it's not a sustainable thing, yeah? It's, it's great, it works for calculator problems, but doesn't work in our context, yeah? Yeah, design pattern soup, yeah, you come excited from a training and now you want to try all those things because it's what is referred to as RDD, resume driven development. Right? Okay, so that's, that's another interesting technique. I'm going to touch upon that. We tried that, didn't really work very well. Uh, we uh, emphasize that people have to write unit tests and they have to have certain amount of code coverage without which your, your code will not get accepted. Someone in the management decides that I think 80 is a good percentage. Right? We don't know what it actually means, but 80 sounds like a reasonable number. So let's just force it down, 80% code coverage, otherwise no appraisals this time. And how does that work? It works beautifully. You get 90% code coverage. You delete the tests, or you delete the code, you run the test, everything still works. It's like, wow. Why? Because there are no assert statements, right? Or if there are assert statements, assert true equals true. <laughs> All you're making sure is no exceptions are thrown, but we know how to deal with that. Try catch around the test and boom, there it goes. Right, so whenever people try and force these things down, and we've all done this in our own individual capacities at various points, and we've seen that it's actually not had much of an impact. Yeah? Then we say, ah, 
code reviews right let's let's mandate code reviews in the organization let's get every junior developer who writes crappy code to be reviewed by senior developers but senior developers also write crappy code <laughs> let's hire someone who can review everybody's code and make sure that we get great code quality and then often they're just debating about you know parentheses should be on this line and you know the curly braces should be here and stuff like that uh, I mean, there is limited success with code, call, uh, code reviews, but often, you know, the, the ROI is questionable. I don't know about your experience, but that's kind of been my experience. Not to say that these things are bad, I'm just trying to highlight that while these things are good, in reality, you know, a lot of times we struggle with some of these things. The one other thing that I think a lot of people in the XP community will talk about is Pair programming. So let's uh, watch this old video of uh, me and JB Reinsberg. Uh, how many people here know JB? Few people, yeah. Uh, one of the you know very strong founders of uh, you know this trying to basically not founders but trying to uh, ex make XP really popular. Uh, one of the Guardian Pask Award winner by the Agile Alliance. But let's quickly see this. Decimal to binary. Decimal to binary. All right. So okay. given five, you want to convert it to one zero one. One zero one. All right. And this is the ugly pairing. Yes. All right. <laughs> oh! Nice. Can't even fix a freaking. All right, I'll start oh, now. Dude. <laughs> God damn. So when am I gonna? Here, here, here. When am I gonna get to pair with Jeff? Ooh, no <laughs> suggestions for. All right, so uh, what, are, what are we doing, man? Why don't you drive? <laughs> You're closer. Come on. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I started the timer. Anyway, you get. You the started time. the timer already. That's cheating, dude. Supposed to be mean to each other. Intentional, like some of those anti-patterns that you. We can multitask, dude. Don't like, worry about. Yeah. So. So what are we talking here? Decimal to binary, I think. Yeah. Anyway, uh, th that was just a fun video we did in 2010 conference uh, where we were trying to show like how, what, what's, what are typical ways you see people pair programming in, in organizations. It's literally one person working, the other person dozing off most often. Or it's, it's used as a way to train somebody on the job uh, and things like that, which are not necessarily bad things, but they don't solve the code quality issue right away. Uh, and something to be aware. The other common issue is that people start ramping up the testing team, right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen this, but you often find that whenever you have code quality issues, the, the typical answer is let's hire more testers. It's not going to address your code quality issue, but it's going to stop bad things going out of the door, but it stops anything going out of the door. Uh, people try uh, things like Sonar, Sonar Lint, uh, you know, various other static code analysis tools. They try and integrate it with it. Uh, and, and some of these are kind of, again, quite useful, but have their own problems. So I want to quickly touch upon some uh, challenges that we fees, uh, feel with this. Uh, one of the big challenges that we typically run is these initiatives end up being pretty in isolation. So they don't actually help much. Uh, they, they end up just being in isolation and then don't create a culture around this. So they just stay in pockets, but your overall code quality is still kind of bad. Uh, people live in an age of instant gratification, where if they do something, they want instant gratification. And the challenge with, uh, with, with some of these things that we were talking, pair programming, unit testing, test-driven development, et cetera, et cetera, is you need to invest. It takes at least six months or sometimes a year before you can actually see real advantage, right? Has anyone implemented TDD and seen the benefit like next week? One person, okay. Uh, it's, it's usually a much longer uh, journey in terms of actually getting some of the benefits out of it. Uh, a lot of times you have tools, uh, I've put Sonar Cube here, but there could be any other tool that overwhelm you with all kinds of feedback and so much non-actionable uh, data that you don't know what to do about. And people just start ignoring like we ignore traffic lights, right? It's just too overwhelming for people to deal with some of these things. Uh, often these are like all or nothing 
uh, kind of a thing. Like you need to do all of this or you get nothing. And to me, this is a non-starter. This is not a great way to approach this. So I'm going to look at some possible alternatives. Again, not suggesting that this is a silver bullet and this will work for everyone. Some things that we've tried and have had some successes with this. Uh, but before that, I think we should talk about the most important part of this presentation, which is to talk about me. Right? So my name is Naresh. I live in Mumbai. Don't act in Bollywood yet. Uh, I started uh, long back with a company called ThoughtWorks, which is where I kind of got exposure to all these cool techniques of extreme programming and you know, we did some really great work uh, learning extreme programming practices and stuff like that. Scrum was considered a bad name, bad word, and it's still. Uh, then I was part of uh, this company called Tecti, where, where again, it's, it's one of these places where I went from ThoughtWorks thinking like code quality, CI, CD, these are, the, these are the standard way of doing things, version control, like who would, who would question some of these things. And then you show up at this company and you're like, what? But they are amazingly successful, so you ask yourself like, what's wrong, right? Is something wrong with me or with them? Uh, and, and same thing, uh, and, and then I went uh, to be a partner at Industrial Logic where we built e-learning, uh, taught a lot of people at Google, at Amazon, a bunch of other companies how to write uh, good quality code and stuff like that. Uh, started my own uh, startup, frustrated with trying to help people, developers especially improve. Uh, it's, it's just better to focus on kids, they listen, right? So I, I started uh, an, a, a company called Adventure Labs where we would build games for kids to learn mental arithmetics. Didn't work out well, uh, spent a lot of money, crashed, burnt, dead. Uh, I continue to run conferences and that's, that's kind of where uh, my passion for building a platform conf engine that we use. Uh, so I happen to be one of the uh, developer on this project and right now the only developer on this project. Uh, but uh, conf engine is actually something started in 2012, so it's been going on for a while. Uh, we've done about uh, $2 million worth of ticket sales through this. So it's, it's, a, it's not a pet project, it's, it's beyond the pet project status. Uh, we have about 100,000 users actively using it, uh, and we have zero automated tests. Right. Uh, so I, I'll talk about that a little bit later in, the, in, the, in this talk. Uh, but then I went and uh, joined this company called Hike Messenger, where I was a, a you know, consultant trying to help them. Uh, and again, uh, one of those moments where this is the fastest unicorn, but some of the code quality things are, are pretty bad. And you know, like sitting and thinking, how could this possibly be working at 100 million user scale when the code quality is so bad? Uh, so again, you go back to this question that is there something wrong with them or something wrong with you? Uh, anyway, these days uh, I, I, I run a consulting company and I'm helping a large investment bank with their data strategy. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit about me, uh, but let's come back to some possible alternatives and hopefully this helps you understand why uh, I'm probably qualified a little bit to talk about some of the topics that I'll be talking about. Uh, so what are some of the alternatives? Uh, one of the things we saw is that uh, when you put sonar and you have some interesting you know, data that is coming out of the sonar, nobody goes and looks at sonar. So the first hack that we tried is what if Sonar could post these feedback on your pull request. The moment someone creates a pull request, what if Sonar could put some of this feedback on the pull request so the person who's going to merge or approve the PR is at least going to look at it saying what's all this noise on this page, right? And so the first thing we did was basically uh, did a quick hack uh, using PR Builder. So PR Builder watches uh, whenever there is a new pull request that comes in, you basically look at the pull request, you run it against a, a, you know, a Sonar instance that you have, takes the comments from Sonar and puts it as comments on the PR itself. Uh, so instead of asking people to go and look at different places, bring that feedback into the pull request itself. And what we saw is, uh, you know, people complained a lot that this sonar thing is nonsense. Like, why is this a problem? Why is that a problem? What does this even mean, right? Like, why is this not stopping me to, uh, why is this stopping me to merge the code? And that was a great starting point because people now started at least taking interest in understanding what this thing even means, 
right? And we went through a lot of refinement. Arun was there. Uh, Arun uh, remembers. We did, we did a lot of refinements to basically come up with a minimalistic set of, uh, of rules in Sonar that we thought were absolutely necessary, that the code, any newcoming code should, should meet. And it would only check on the delta code, not on everything. Right? So if, if there are changes that are made, it would only assert, the ch uh, only would verify the quality of that. And so what we saw is, you know, it would produce things like this and then we would say if there are critical issues, then you won't be able to merge the code. Uh, which came as a, as a bit of a top-down kind of a push, but at least got people to start paying attention. Uh, did this improve the quality of the code? Not really, right? But what this did is ma started making people a little aware of some of these concepts that we were trying to talk about, make it a little bit more practical and contextual in what they are trying to do day to day. Instead of running a theoretical class on static code analysis, this is what cyclomatic complexity means, this is what this means. Uh, I mean, it's, it's more of a pull-based approach rather than a push-based approach. Uh, once we did this, one of the things we realized is, you know, we could actually do something slightly better than this. Uh, because the challenge we had is people who were merging the pull request didn't really see what was the impact or didn't know what was the impact of this pull request if they merged this code. So we wanted to give them some kind of a, uh, some kind of a measure or a, or, a, or a sense of how risky this pull request is that you're trying to merge. Because again, remember what we're trying to do is stop bad things from coming into the main trunk. So, you know, what kind of tools, how can we enable people to make those decisions better? So the next step we tried was what we call as the PR risk advisor. Uh, PR risk advisor is essentially any time a, a pull request is created, it will look at all historical data and it will give you a report like this saying, you know, this is what the pull request is about, these are the files that have been changed in this pull request, uh, this is the number of lines in this file, this is the churn as in how many times this file has changed recently. Uh, here are the number of bugs that this file has been committed in the recent times when, whenever a bug was fixed. Uh, this particular file was involved in those bug fixes, right, that this file had changed when we did this. It would have things like what is the cyclomatic complexity, percentage of duplication. Again, all of this information just pulled out of Sonar. Some information that is there with whatever project management tool that you're using. So, you know, and we had a convention that anytime you're checking in, uh, Any time you're making a commit uh, or raising a pull request, you would put uh, the, the ticket ID in it. So we could see if this is a bug, this is a new feature, and we could have some intelligence like that. So what this did is this actually helped us, uh, help the reviewers uh, who were reviewing the code make a lot more informed decisions. And at this point, people started paying a lot more attention to some of the things in Sonar that it was giving in terms of static code analysis. All right. Still no tests, still none of that stuff. It's just very basic, kind of starting with making people aware of uh, the code quality and helping people who are reviewing the code uh, to, to make more informed decisions. Clear so far? The next thing uh, was a big influence from this particular talk uh, at, uh, at the functional programming conference, and I happen to be wearing the t-shirt today, uh, was uh, by Aaron. Who is a, uh, who's a professor and a PhD student uh, in Indiana University. And uh, he talked about design patterns versus anti-pattern in uh, APL. How many people have heard of this programming language APL? It stands for A programming language, which tells you how old and outdated this language is. But it's still one of the most fascinating language out there. It was originally created to, uh, by uh, Jacob Iverson to create, uh, to help mathematicians, uh, you know, represent uh, mathematical notations. And so the language has been around for 50 plus years. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is these guys have been living under the rock uh, and they've been doing some very fascinating things. Everything that we consider as best practices, these, consider, these guys consider as an anti-pattern. And this, so there's something really fascinating that's happening and I, I kind of drew a lot of inspiration from this talk and try to bring in some of these techniques back at work. So for example, one of the things they talk about is uh, abstractions are considered harmful. We consider a lot of things 
that we have done over the years in terms of abstraction is very important. Uh, but these guys considered abstraction very, uh, it's uh, abstraction considered harmful. And one of the things they talk about is if you can make your things, uh, you know, a lot more transparent rather than abstract, a lot more visible, then it's that much more easier to understand what's going on. Otherwise, a lot of times in name of abstraction, we just jump through hoops and hoops, hoops and hoops before we understand what's going on. Uh, the other interesting thing that they talk about is uh, basically, what else can I talk about? There's, there's, there's a whole bunch of interesting things, but yeah, one of the things they talk about is libraries considered harmful, especially black box libraries considered harmful. And that the thought process is that if, you, if you're going to have uh, these black box libraries, you don't know what's going on inside that. And if, you, if you're going to use some of these things, uh, then you don't know what impact it's going to create on your software. Uh, one other thing that they considered harmful, and this language has, right now it has if statements and control structures, but generally any APLR wouldn't write code with if or switch or any of these things. Uh, you know, the, the way they write code is, is, is very interesting. Like you, you write code as if there are no conditional logic in your code. And the way they achieve that is by turning that into a data structure. And so you then just basically take the data structure and you do data structure manipulation. To give you an example, uh, you've all looked at the schedule in Confingen, right? The multi-track uh, version of it, right? Now imagine as a programmer, if you're building something like this, the way you would typically do is you would have a list of sessions in the database sorted by time. So you would get the list of sessions sorted by time and sorted by track. And then you would have a big for loop and then you will iterate over the for loop you will take each session of that list and you will check what type of a session it is. Oh, it's a keynote, which means it needs to be shown across all the four tracks, right? It's a 90 minute workshop, which means it needs to span across multiple sessions, right? Things like that. So you'd have a big for, for loop and a bunch of conditional logic inside it for each of the special conditions that you want to handle these things, right? Someone in APL would look at that code and just delete it. Yeah, because you don't write code like that. Instead, what they would do is they would write these small functions. Each function would basically be like five characters long. Uh, and then they would basically uh, say that if this is this, what should happen to this? So essentially, you get the uh, data from the database, convert it into a two-dimensional matrix, and then you apply. Uh, so you have a data which is a linear list. You have a list of functions which needs to be applied and you do a matrix multiplication on that, and it spits out a two-dimensional, uh, you know, schedule out. And it's fascinating to just see that you, there's no if conditions, there's no, you know, none of that. It's just a matrix multiplication. So we started applying some of these techniques in the way we were writing code as a way to kind of help people improve and simplify code. I think what I'm trying to talk about is we get carried away too much with all the design patterns and all of the fancy stuff. But sometimes when you look at these old languages and draw inspiration from them, uh, they have a very different and a very simplistic way of writing code, uh, which I think can really help improve the quality of the code. All right. Uh, all this is fine, people say, you know, this is all great. If I'm writing new code, I can, I can put in a lot of these checks and stuff like that. But the real problem is, you know, we have to deal with legacy code. We have stuff that has been written, uh, you know, yesterday and it's legacy, nobody wants to touch that and people fear touching that. Why do people fear touching that? Because we don't understand enough about it, there are no tests, we don't know if we change something, what will break, you know, all of those kind of typical challenges. So what do you do when you have legacy code? Where do you start? This is kind of like, we've been trying to solve these problems for 20 years, but every company you go into and you say, okay, you have legacy problem, but where would you start? And sometimes consultants go in and say, hey, just let's take six months out and we're going to refactor all your code and then we'll be good, right? We will have a, a team of people writing tests. We will have a team of people refactoring your code and at the end of it, everything will magically come together and life will be great after that. Never seen that work, unfortunately. Uh, so what we do is, uh, there's, a, there's an open source tool that I had built uh, quite a few years ago. It's called C3. What it does, it helps you visualize the quality of your code. Uh, so let me just take a minute and explain what this complicated graph looks like. So this is a tree map. Uh, what this tree map is doing is those, uh, let me see. Uh, 
you see these boxes, uh, each of those big boxes is, is kind of a package or a folder inside your code base. So this is a fairly large code base. And then each of these black lines is basically representing a file. So if you see a big box, that means that whole folder is fairly big. Inside that, this particular file is relatively much larger in size as compared to the smaller file. Uh, so it gives you a, a tree visualization, a hierarchical view of what your code base is. And then it uses color as a way to signify what is your C3 score. Uh, and the way we calculate the C3 score is we look at what is the complexity of this code, which is cyclomatic complexity, linear paths through your code, right? If you have a if else in your code, then your cyclomatic complexity is two. There are two linear paths through your code. If you have more conditions, then the cyclomatic complexity is higher. There are a lot of studies that show the higher your cyclomatic complexity, the more likely people are, you know, going to make mistakes in that code because it's harder to understand. Then the next parameter it looks at is your code coverage, which is essentially uh, what is the code coverage on this code. And most often with legacy code, the code coverage is zero or very minimalistic. And the third parameter it looks at is churn, how many times this particular file has been changed in the last 30 days, right? So it takes those three parameters, put them together, and does a weighted average of those three to give you a visualization. So whatever you see as big red things are problem areas. But the biggest red spot in that is probably the, you know, the hot spot in your application. That, you know, there may be like these two, three files that everybody touches on a daily basis, has very high complexity, has very low coverage, right? So that is the place where I would want to start investing some time and addressing those issues rather than uh, saying, oh, you know, this file doesn't have code coverage, so I'm going to go and write some tests against it. Right? So this is kind of trying to make it a little bit more pragmatic for people to approach this and trying to simplify saying, you know, if you want to figure out what are the hotspots in your application, you run C3 through it, it will basically give you a visualization. And as you make improvements in your code, you can see if actually you are reducing some of those hotspots or not. As new code comes in, you want to see how this graph is evolving over a period of time. So this seemed to be a very kind of a handy tool for me at least to kind of visualize the code quality and start, uh, you know, having discussions with people saying how can we improve the code quality of this. Uh, the other tool that uh, we used which was kind of very helpful, uh, I don't know if uh, people have attended Puneet's talk. Uh, Puneet was here a couple of years ago. Uh, he's the author of this tool called Diffie. This was built at Twitter when essentially what they were trying to do is when Twitter was trying to move from their Rails backend to uh, a more uh, to a, from a monolithic to a microservices kind of an architecture, uh, they wanted some way to know that as they break these services into microservices, they are not, you know, breaking the contract and they're not making, the, the results are not coming out differently. Uh, so one of the interesting things this did is, is to compare what the old code gives you, what the old API gives you versus what the new API gives you. So what they do is they take the traffic that's coming, the live traffic that's coming, they basically fork the traffic, they send it through uh, this new instance that you have and an old instance that you have, you get the response back and then you compare the two instances and you see what is the difference. So as you build your microservices without actually writing any tests, you now have a way to validate what's the difference between that. But when they started doing that, one of the problems they found is that it would give you a lot of false negative, which means, you know, IDs could be different or timestamps could be different, you know, slightly different and that would start failing the test saying, hey, something is different. So how do you deal with that? That's kind of where Diffie comes into action is what they do is they, they set up three instances. So this is the candidate instance, which is essentially the new instance, a new microservice instance or new API instance. Uh, primary and secondary are the existing, uh, you know, old code. And then you take the difference between these two guys and you get non-deterministic differences. And then you take the difference between these two and you get the raw differences. Then you again take the difference between these two to eliminate any non-deterministic, you know, non, basically noise out of it. And they've done some very interesting stuff. They use a bit of machine learning to kind of 
figure out what is deterministic, non-deterministic, what should be important, what should not be important. And this is something that we kind of also heavily use, especially when in the legacy code, uh, when people start making changes without them having to write tests, you would run these diffy things and then you would get differences and then you would kind of show them, visualize like what is the difference between these two instances. And uh, eventually we hooked it up with CI and stuff like that uh, so that every time someone checks in they get that kind of a feedback. But originally it was just as a pilot we would run this in the side and see if, you know, as you are basically making changes to your services, are you breaking backward compatibility or not. Now again the limitation of this is this works well for services, backend stuff, uh, not necessarily for UI. Uh, I know Puneet is working on some ideas to, to make this uh, extensible for UI as well. But this is a, again a pretty interesting tool that we have. So quickly going to pause, I, I've, I've spoken at a length about a bunch of different ideas that we tried. So the first idea just to recap, uh, we try to take whatever feedback was there and pull that back into, uh, into your PR itself so people can see that and kind of start at least be curious about it help uh, give information to the reviewers uh, from a PR risk assessor to kind of help them understand how they can improve uh, when they're basically reviewing uh, code. Uh, if there are, if it's a high risk, then at least they would probably check out the code locally and then they'll run it locally and see what's going on. So that kind of helps improve the uh, quality of the incoming code. Uh, after that, I talked about, you know, some influence from APL and array-oriented programming in terms of focus on simplicity and trying to help uh, people simplify things. Uh, not focus so much on TDD or classroom trainings or things like that, but more uh, practical stuff that people can appreciate. Uh, then I talked about that all that is great, but if you have legacy code, then what do you do? So I talked about C3 as a way to visualize what are your hotspots and kind of use that as a way to drive some of these changes. Uh, I talked about Diffy, which is something that we used in the back end to kind of visualize what are the, as people are making changes, are they breaking things. Again, this is all without trying to invest a lot of effort in writing test suites and things like that. This is kind of almost getting, uh, at least for APIs, getting testing for free. Um, so far with me? Yep. I talked about coming back to this uh, testing pyramid and uh, this is something that I used to show quite often in terms of the, the, the different types of tests that we would put in into a system. And what I realized is while this is great, how do you start with this? Right? Like you want to have this kind of a test pyramid in your organization, but where do you start with this? Because developers are busy and they're not interested in this, so where do you go? One of the things that actually worked very well for us is we had a team of automation engineers who were very enthusiastic and kind of felt like they were second class citizens in the organization. Uh, do other people have the same experience? Yeah? Uh, so what we did is we said, okay, there are these guys who are good with automation, they care about quality, they really like some of these things. So how about we actually work with them, help them learn some of these techniques so they can actually go in the code and start putting in some of these tests, uh, you know, themselves without actually having the developers to come in. Because again, you know, unless you see the value in your context, you won't be convinced. And trying to convince developers to, you know, invest in some of these things is much harder as, as opposed to, you know, working with automation engineers who are already kind of invested in this and it's easier to kind of help them. And also they feel like they're learning new skills and they're growing. Uh, in, in terms of their career, so that actually became a nice hook for us. Uh, so uh, me, Arun, a bunch of other people started working with the, with the automation engineers and kind of helping them understand how they could write component tests, how they could write, uh, you know, integration tests, how they could write other kinds of tests. Uh, and then kind of check that code back into the same repo, right? Not into a different place, but check that code back into the same repo. Uh, this is one of the examples I'm running short of time. Uh, but this is one of the examples where I explain the different levels and how we went about doing that. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something again that has been existed a long time back uh, from a long time. I, mean, I remember this slide is uh, from 2003, uh, one of my slides from 2003. Uh, and this, this used to work really well back in the days, 
but now you know trying to get this kind of a commitment from people is much much more harder so we kind of hijacked this and we we just started the uh, getting the automation engineers to kind of help us uh, put some of these things in place uh, in in retrospect not not from the from the before and once we started doing this for for about 3 months then developers started taking interest in some of these things they started seeing that how this actually helps and then there was some interest in the organization i wouldn't i wouldn't stand here and lie saying oh everybody in the organization was doing that it was not uh, only few people took interest and then that started coming in but i think i was happy because you know at least you get some momentum going you can't get everybody on board but you can get some people to start doing some of these things one thing that actually worked really well is this whole discussion around acceptance criteria uh, and that was something that we saw was growing a lot more and i so i would say that that's something that i would also encourage all of you to kind of push back into your organization saying before you start building on something focus on acceptance criteria and that will help again improve the quality of the incoming code because some of the assumptions will get caught at this stage uh standard slide on uh, how we do continuous integration going to skip some of this uh, because i i think i would jump to questions so i know it's a bit of rush but i i want to take some time for questions i just talked about a few ideas that might be useful for you to consider uh, as you're trying to help influence this is trying to uh, say that you know don't go big bang uh, in terms of uh, you know getting everyone to do trainings and then expect magic to happen because that never works uh, instead look at some of these simpler uh, smaller starting points to create this culture where people start caring about quality and start caring about uh, simplicity in the code and that can be a much better starting point for improving the quality of the incoming code all right with that we have 5 minutes for questions yeah so uh, your last couple of slides kind of touched my topic but i still want to ask how to incentivize a developer to do unit test how to incentivize the developers to do unit test uh for, what is the real value in unit test? you can't check uh, check every path probably at a function level so every line of code is getting authenticated so probably you may not uh, you may handle all the error scenarios at a unit level not expecting your system level to handle all the error paths okay so it's getting much more pinpointed feedback at the at the source rather than you know a, a permutation of different combinations coming at the at the top level so you know you think that's the real value of unit test and do do developers really care about that you saw your pyramid probably the biggest return that you could get for the time that you've invested because we find i mean as you said the feedback is so early you know uh, if if developer could see it that way maybe that's one way of uh, helping them to so if the developers saw that it would help them with feedback and it will improve that then they would they would I be mean, interested but the the catch compared there compared to the entire outcome i'm not talking only about their program but compared to the entire outcome this activity will have always have maximum yeah outcome. but the catch there is developers writing good unit tests right because you could write unit tests but you not get that kind of a feedback right so how do you incentivize developers to write good unit tests and that's a hard problem in my opinion i spent 10 15 years trying to do that and i gave up uh i think it's 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 hard to get developers to incentivize right not that i'm not saying that it's it's wrong we should not be doing that but i'm just saying it's a much harder problem to do that right so instead what i'm suggesting is you don't start with unit test you start with some of these other peripheral things that will help people get a feel for what it means to get quicker feedback it may not be through unit test but maybe through some other mechanism static code analysis er risk assessor or other kinds of things and then the, you may start addicting them to this habit of getting some kind of a feedback every time they check in stuff and then you can say hey you can do something better by doing this in in the code but then there is this whole contrasting thing that's going on in the industry that we also should be aware of right uh, fred george talks about this so when they started doing microservices uh, at uh, at uh, internet uh, what was that a forward internet company uh they their 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 microservices were not more than 100 lines of code and you know if 
if you can't write 100 lines of code without making a mistake, then there's a problem. But also more importantly, the way you build the system is it's resilient. Even if you make mistakes, it's okay, you can deal with it. So sometimes, you know, the way you architect things and stuff like that, you may say, well, you don't really need that much of a pinpointed feedback and you can deal without that, uh, at least to kind of start this, this whole notion. So there is, yeah, there is the different kind of a thought process. Yeah, I have a specific, specific question on Diffie. Uh, so once the server goes down, so whatever we are seeing the uh, difference, right? Uh, we are not able to see in anywhere. So do we have any log for that? When a server goes down, like uh, one of the Diffie no, uh, yeah, where the candidate is running basically. Okay. So, so you have the candidate, you have two other, the primary and secondary, one of those kind of go down. Uh, yeah, where there's uh, basically Diffie is running. That's uh, where we deployed the jar, Diffie jar, right? Yeah. So if it is goes down, it is setting down. So we are not able to see the differences in the UI, whatever you show that HTTP or something, right? Correct. So I mean, if it goes down, you, you're not going to see. So I'm not sure like what you're oh. Is it, is it possible to save that log or somewhere? Sir? Oh, so it does output whatever is going on as a log. You can actually suck out uh, a log on a live, uh, correct, on a live basis. So one of the things we did is in our CI, we would actually keep uh, looking at that. And if it went down, we basically pause the test, bring up Diffie again, uh, because sometimes it does go down and then you run it again. So yeah, uh, you, you do have some of those problems. They have a hosted solution now where they put all of these things in place. All right, I'm, I'm out of time. I will be around, so I'll happy to take more questions outside uh, and happy to talk about why I don't write tests anymore. Uh, so we didn't get into that topic, but happy to take some of those questions. Thank you.